The train drew up in a station patrolled by a scarce amount of little soldiers in grey uniforms. We had reached Manchuli. The flag of a brand new kingdom flew above the station buildings. It was yellow, with a pleasant agglomeration of stripes in one corner. But the flag was the only outward sign of change. True, there was a little Japanese official who took the German consul and myself off to a remote part of the village, and there, when we had filled up forms the size of sagas, issued us with the new Manchu Quo visas. They take up a page in one's passport. They are recognized by only two other countries, Japan and Salvador. But even this bureaucratic interlude had its typical Chinese side. We traveled to the passport office in a tiny, decrepit droshki pulled by a mouse-like pony. Crowded though it already was, we were saddled with a supercargo in the shape of an enormous coolie. He did nothing at all except slightly slow our progress. But his presence was clearly part of a recognized routine, and when it was all over, he demanded a tip. He described himself as a visa porter. The Chinese flair for creating employment is wonderfully quick. The passport office had only been open a month. This text was written by Peter Fleming, the older brother of Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond. He traveled to China via the Soviet Union in 1934, and all of his journey is recorded in his book, One's Company. You'll see throughout his travels in Manchuria that he's not shy about sharing some pretty bad opinions of people, and to give you some that he had in Russia, he said one of the most curious things about modern Russia is the ugliness of the women. Bolshevism appears to be incompatible with beauty. He then goes on to complain about the window dressing in shops, but is confused by this because, as he claims, the leaders of Bolshevism are Jewish, and Jews are good salesmen, so why would they have bad window dressings? Well, here he has completed the Trans-Siberian journey and entered Manchuria, which was only taken by the Japanese a couple years beforehand. The next morning, we reached Harbin, which has been called the Paris of the Far East, but not, I think, by anyone who has stayed there for any length of time. It is a place with a great deal of not easily definable character. The Red Engineer, working on the Chinese Eastern Railway. The White Russian Lady in Exile, grown fat on the luxuries of nostalgia, forever fantastically scheming the downfall of the Soviets. The Chinese Coolie and the Chinese Merchant, the British Taipan on his way to lunch at the Yacht Club. All these form a shifting, curious pattern in the crowded streets. Athwart that shifting pattern, nosing its way through the crowd, comes a Japanese armored car on its way back from a police raid. You need look no further for the Masters of Harbin. But the Masters of Harbin have got their hands full. The city lives under a reign of terror which, in 1932, at the time of the shooting of Mrs. Woodruff, had reached such a pitch of intensity that even on the golf links, a white Russian guard, armed to the teeth, was much more indispensable than a caddy. Few foreigners fared to walk abroad at night, and none to walk unarmed. But even the least adventurous still find it easy to live dangerously in Harbin, a pole the branch manager of an important British firm, entertained me in a compound of which the wall was crowned with electrified barbed wire. He received the usual threat, a little paper figure of a man with a bullet hole inked in red upon his forehead. This was accompanied by an exorbitant demand for dollars and the instructions as to how they should be delivered. The poll went to the Japanese commissioner of police and a young samurai officer was detailed to protect him. For some time, the officer slept every night at the foot of his staircase, his long sword ready to his hand. Maybe one group here needs a little explaining, the White Russian Guards. Well, as many of you may know, the Russian Civil War saw the Bolshevik Red Army fight the White Army. And after the war, many anti-Bolsheviks fled to Manchuria and settled there. There, they established their own fascist party under the leadership of Konstantin Rodzevsky. And just three kilometers away from the Soviet border, set up a headquarters with a bright neon swastika to show their power to the communists on the other side. But they only ever really had around 12,000 members or so. 
Nevertheless, once in Manchuria, they even joined the Manchuko Imperial Army, and there, a Sano Brigade fought the Soviets during their border skirmish at Kalkin Gol, but they were all but destroyed. Some continued to fight in the Japanese forces alongside Mongols, Chinese, Koreans and the likes, but as Fleming points out, for now these war veterans often found work as security men in the streets of Harbin. In Harbin, I also entered for the first time the portals of an opium den. In my experience, all opium dens are small, stuffy, and extremely disappointing to regular readers of fiction. In those respects, if in no others, they resemble the dressing rooms of actresses. My first den experience was no exception to this rule. It was empty, save for a facetious attendant and one very old man stretched out neatly on a wooden couch. He was asleep and no doubt dreaming. His features wore a look of the most profound boredom. I refused a pipe and left the building. From Harbin, I took the train to Xingqing, the new capital of Manchu Kuo, and incidentally the youngest capital in the world. It had hardly adapted itself to the greatness so suddenly thrust upon, but was used to special correspondence. Members of that overrated profession had been indeed its only foreign visitors. Firmly but courteously, I was launched upon a round of interviews, and for three days I interviewed people without stopping. The procedure was monotonous and unreal. Your Chinese minister would be found lurking in the recesses of a former school or office buildings. He received you with the utmost courtesy, bowing ceremoniously in his long silk robe. Tea was produced, and cigarettes. He was the minister of state for this or that. But in one corner of the room sat a clerk who took down a verbatim report of the interview for submission, presumably, to the powers behind the throne. So it behooved the minister to be guarded in his speech. Quite soon I decided that interviews were a waste of time. One of them, however, was not. I was granted an audience by His Excellency Henry Pu Yi, chief executive of the state of Manchu Kuo, and today its emperor. The temporary palace was the former offices of the Salt Gabelle. The Chinese soldiers on guard at the gate wore smarter uniforms than usual. They were armed with new Japanese service rifles. I sent in my card and was presently ushered into an anteroom. This was full of Chinese officers of the Manchu Kuo army, with a sprinkling of Japanese. One of these took over the duties of my interpreter. Eventually, we were summoned into a large parlor-like room, furnished in the European style and having a markedly uninhabited air. Mr. Pu Yi received us alone. He is a tall young man of 29, much better looking and alert than you would suppose from his photographs, which invariably credit him with a dazed and rather tortoise-like appearance. All three of us bowed and smiled a great deal and then sat down. This is the new ruler of Manchuko, Pu Yi. He was the former emperor of China who was ousted in 1911 when he was just a child. Although people tried to bring him back to power in 1917, the plot failed, and he continued living in the Forbidden City until the 1920s. Then, once he was removed from the Forbidden City, he was allowed to live as an exile in the Japanese concession of Tanjin. China at that time was under the control of various warlords, and he did entertain the idea of forming an alliance with some of them. However, in 1928, the Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek marched north to reunify China, and once in Beijing, they looted the Qing mausoleum. So when the Japanese invaded Manchuria, he met with them, looking to be restored to his throne, but would of course be their puppet. So Fleming joins this former Chinese emperor as a puppet of the Japanese but Fleming has complained that most people he interviewed gave no real answers to serious questions, but rather just replied with the term Wang Tao, which means the principle of benevolent rule. For instance, he gives the example of asking an official, had the use of bombers on anti-bandit operations resulted in a lot of innocent death, and the official just responded with Wang Tao. So after the usual pleasantries, he decided to ask Pu Yi some hard-hitting questions, not knowing what the response would be. I tried a long shot, reasoning that even potential emperors must like to talk about themselves. I asked which had been the happiest time in his life, 
the old days in the Forbidden City, or his untroubled exile in Tintsien, or the present, when he was back in the saddle again. With a delightful smile, he replied at length. The interpreter began to translate. His Excellency says that so long as you feel benevolent towards everyone, so long as you practice the principles of Wang Tao, happiness is surely only a question of, he droned on, the formula had been rediscovered. Very soon I took my leave. I often think of Mr. Pu Yi, that charming though reticent young man. He is surely the most romantic of the rulers of this world. The strong men in funny shirts, the dim presidents in top hats, Moscow's grubby Jews in 1910 Rolls Royces, the Rajas and the Emirs and the Shahs, the big kings and little kings. All these we have seen before. We have got used to them. But Mr. Pu Yi is a new line in rulers. Disinherited from an empire, he now finds himself the nominal head of a new state which once formed part of that empire. He is a figurehead, owing his position to an alien and, for most of his countrymen, a hated race. What does he feel when he watches them at work? I often wonder. I am not sorry to leave Xing King. The atmosphere is too thick with humbug for comfort. The conscientious journalist will hardly escape that affliction which is now known in Manchuria as propaganda elbow. Every time you visit an official, he gives you a small assload of pamphlets, tracts and proclamations. Propaganda elbow is contracted from carrying this vast and unwieldy bundle back to your hotel. The Japanese are not very good at propaganda and they go in for it far too much. Few will be interested, none will be convinced. I lost patience with the stuff. The Japanese, I reflected, are doing what is, taken by and large, good work in Manchuria. And even if it was not good work, no one is going to stop them from doing it. This being so, why this perpetual gilding of the lily? Why these redundant attempts to pass off a policy of enlightened exploitation as a piece of disinherited rescue work? This breeds skepticism in foreign observers, and the next time he meets an official, he decides that the Japanese are a race of liars and not to be trusted a yard. The truth is, I think, that this frantic and misguided insistence on propaganda has its roots in an inferiority complex. The unsubtle Western methods of propaganda are a game to which, like many other games, the Japanese are new. Behind their sturdy bluster, they are shy and uncertain of themselves.